Peace, Salaam. This is Imam Malik Mujahid and you're watching Muslim Network TV. Muslim Network TV is always there on Galaxy 19 satellite, Raku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, whole lot of social media, but of course on our website, muslimnetwork.tv as well. Uh, today we'll be talking about disaster relief and preparedness and relief work, which we do, which the whole world is doing it. And there may be hundreds of organizations which are involved in there. And all citizens feel they need to be part of it. I remember Katrina, when the Federal Emergency Management Authority, FEMA, and the federal government was nowhere to be found. And it was people who neighbors for helping neighbors. Uh, there is a mosque in New Orleans. It was a little higher ground. It became a center of uh, a relief work, which was organized by citizens. Then other uh, faith communities got involved and they became the first responders. I remember raising funds in Chicago along with other people uh, in which Muslim and Baptist and other denomination will take turn and feeding close to 25,000 people. So one day of Muslims and uh, we were all involved in supporting that uh, as well. So uh, there's a federal government has a disaster relief uh, month, uh, national prepared month they're calling. Uh, September is supposed to be that. Did you notice that? Did you know about it? There are so many months and days and sometimes it is difficult to keep track of those, but I like their uh, slogan, disaster don't wait, make your plan today. Uh, well, I hope at least you who are watching and myself uh, will pay attention to that. As our nation continue to respond to pandemic, there is no better time to be involved in preparedness. Uh, it is normally said that the uh, Americans were not ready for this pandemic, uh, government was not ready. Definitely, I was not ready. And we were learning uh, while doing. Is America ready? Uh, are they prepared for uh, things of this nature? We'll talk with an impressive letter, uh, leader of Direct Relief. Direct Relief is the name of the organization. And the gentleman is Thomas Thai. Welcome to Muslim Network TV, Thomas Thai. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here and peace with you. Thank you. Thomas Tai has served as president and CEO of Direct Relief, actually is serving that, a not-for-profit humanitarian medical organization. Uh, it is there since October 2000, or Thomas is there since October 2000. Tai served previously as chief operating officer of Peace Corps. Uh, thank you so much uh, and for your amazing contributions. Well, it's my pleasure to be here and likewise, and congratulations on the Muslim Network TV and all the great accomplishments. It's a privilege to be with you. Thank you. So you're in California and how far are fires from you? I heard that, uh, you know, West Coast seems to have more disasters than uh, whatever hurricane we had. So what is the current situation? Well, I, we're either always in a disaster or just, you know, getting out of one or getting ready for the next one because, uh, you know, California is, uh, it has chronic challenges from earthquakes to now increasingly large wildfires each year, as well as heavy rains. And, uh, you know, we had a mudslide here where I am in Santa Barbara a few years ago that uh, took out my house and was the most deadly uh, disaster in San little Santa Barbara's history. So, um, but right now, I think the fires that have been burning up in Northern California and some in Southern California are a bit under control, but we've all been under a warning watch uh, in the whole state because of this record heat wave they expect. So, you know, we're in these interesting times, as you said, where the, the global pandemic arrived uh, on top of a lot of existing challenges and other recurring types of events like, like hurricanes and wildfires. What I was surprised uh, while reading to prepare for this show was that uh, a direct relief uh, provided uh, close to $700,000 in financial support to city 
and uh, county fire departments. Mm -hmm. I thought uh, government helps not for profit, but since when not for profit has started helping government? Well, thank you for reading very carefully into our <clears throat> website. You know, it's an interesting uh, point that you've raised. We don't receive any government funding, and that is not because of any antagonism towards government. It is really for flexibility purposes, I think, is uh, having worked in government necessarily when you're using the taxpayer's money, there are conditions and strings procedures that come along with that. So we have found here uh, at Direct Relief over our 72 years that the desire <clears throat> is to be, you know, performing a public benefit service, which is what government exists for, but doing it privately allows you to do it a little with a little faster, with a little more focus, without all of the other bureaucratic concerns, but the ethics and policy is exactly the same. I mean, you have to do it for the public benefit. That's why nonprofits exist. So when we see uh, out in California, the, the, the expectation that these public agencies, fire departments can do things that they're not prepared to do, uh, just as you said in New Orleans, we, you know, after Katrina, people stepped up, private uh, enterprises in the faith community there's a version of that, I think, in the in the emergency response area where, you know, the the objective is to get the work done. And if we have resources for the public benefit that the public agencies need, we're happy to provide those, um, you know, or not, you know, if, if we can do something directly ourselves. So um, we found that, you know, the the expectations on some of the public safety and first response agencies are completely inconsistent with their available funding and resources. So as resources, uh, as we have access to private resources and we see the need for a vehicle, even a helicopter or something like that, that's in everyone's interest, uh, a public asset, we have participated in those efforts to make sure that um, the funds that we have serve the public's interest in the best way possible. Hmm. <clears throat> So uh, do you have a team which looks for that opportunity in which there's a need for urgent action, <coughs> excuse me, and the government uh, or a city is unable to handle it, or they know how to approach you and they say, well, this needs to be done right now. The government will take longer time to send us some money. So help us out here. How does it work? Yeah, it, it differs from event to event, but typically when there's a major event, the public officials are responsible for managing and coordinating the event. So when we have a wildfire uh, in California, which is a chronic issue, the local county public health officer is in charge of health services for people. And when there's large scale evacuations, um, it's a real challenge because public health uh, agencies in, in California and in many counties around the US they have the responsibility for regulation and advisory opinions and issuing orders, but on a day-to-day -day basis, they do not run all health services for their county. So the dilemma is that, you, you know, they're kind of regulators, overseers um, of, of health services and public health activities, and then something bad happens and they're immediately expected to be in charge of everything, right? And so that, that's just not their job on a, on a normal day. So what we do is we check in with the local county fire departments and the local county health departments and ask them where the gaps are, what they see as a priority. Typically, we can mobilize medications and things like inhalers or antihypertensive medications or insulin. And that's a, those are real challenges in uh, mass evacuations because people may evacuate safely but if they're managing a chronic condition like diabetes or hypertension or asthma, and they don't have their medication when they evacuate, that's and that's what happened in Katrina. Many of the people who ended up in hospitals were not injured by the event of Katrina. They were had a chronic condition that became an acute crisis after they were evacuated. So, uh, for to coordinate those types of things, we always check in with the public officials, tell them the resources we have ask it, you know, what they see as a gap. And uh, sometimes we just work very closely together to make sure that uh, all the resources are spent in the most productive way possible. 
So in our conversation came Katrina, and uh, here you were as a not-for-profit, you try to fill in the gap and a, on a far faster basis uh, than the government uh, system uh, might have worked. Uh, do you? Th what are the lessons we have learned from Katrina in terms of uh, uh, you know the government as well as the civil society? Has there been a, a you know a ten-year review of what what we learned, what what we did not in the civil society or in the at the government level? Uh, yeah, I, I hope so. I mean, <laughs> it's been fifteen years, and I think you know the. the what we've learned, certainly, and I think it's been recognized, is the, the challenge that exists at, even with FEMA, which is not an operational agency. It's a funding agency. It's, a, it, it, it's established policies, but it doesn't have, you know, the labor force to deploy to do things like feeding programs. It can identify um, a need and it can direct financial resources, but I think a lot of the work is necessarily done by members of the local affected communities and uh, and groups that can mobilize volunteers and resources. I think sometimes there's a uh, a jockeying about control, and you know I think people want to be in control, which is fine. But if you're in control and you do not perform your job well, people will recognize that, and then they'll just go do what needs to get done. And that that's kind of that recurring dilemma that there's a relatively short period of a few days where all the citizens, this is Puerto Rico, this is California, this is New Orleans, where they will wait, hopefully, and they will watch TV, wait for the political leaders who will come out and uh, want to explain what's going on and what they're doing. But if it's not working, you know, after a few days, people are going to make that assessment, and then they're going to start doing what they believe is important to do. I think many of the people trust and rely on uh, the places where they worship. And they that's a really critical role. Um, when people are nervous, they look to people they trust. And I think as distrust in, broadly in government agencies uh, has increased, it's important for private organizations and humanitarian groups and the civil society not to make that worse, but to help. And how can we work together with the public agencies and the uh, public service agencies you know, to serve people. That is why we all exist. And um, it's not about control or who gets credit. I think it's, it's just helping the people in a crisis and removing one's ego and trying to get the job done. So that's the approach that we try to take, less about what direct relief, uh, we don't have a strategic plan for a play, New Orleans. Our strategic plan is to help the people there accomplish theirs and to listen carefully and support them as best we can with the resources we have. So have you been part of any gatherings of the civil society, uh, a relief organization, disaster relief agencies, in which they have sat down thinking about, uh, are we together ready for the um, uh, worst scenarios? We try to do that all the time. And most of what direct relief does um, is what we've tried to, in the United States in particular, is we've tried to identify each of the nonprofit community health centers and free and charitable clinics in the United States, right? And they typically exist, the, the federally qualified health centers, in medically underserved areas. That's why they were created in the 60s as part of the civil rights movement, in recognition that at the time, uh, African American, Black Americans had no meaningful access to health services. So the federal government did establish a program that allowed some federal funding to go to nonprofits uh, providing health services in medically underserved areas. Those areas tend to be disproportionately communities of color. So what Direct Relief has done for the past 15, since Katrina, is we've tried to identify and network together all of these uh, locally run nonprofit community health centers and clinics, and that's 30 million people. It's the largest health system in the United States if you think about it like that. It's not like Kaiser or uh, a big network. They're locally run, but they all have the same purpose and mission. So that is uh, having identified all those uh, organizations 
we try to make sure that we have a protocol. So if uh, something hits a, a typhoon, well, I, here it's it's a hurricane. So we have a pre-established contact. We have a protocol to communicate, and we provide prescription medications. So that's a high regulatory bar. That's typically how we respond, because the challenge, as you know, I think that the people who are most vulnerable during an emergency are tend to be the people who are most vulnerable the day before the emergency. People who are low income, people who don't have a big financial cushion, that don't have a lot of resources. And those are the people that these nonprofit civil society, if you will, uh, health uh, centers serve every day. So that's why we are able to move fast in emergencies at Direct Relief because we're usually working with a locally run organization there already. And we just listen and ask them what they need and try to get it to them as fast as we possibly can if it's a health commodity or increasingly now money. Hmm. So uh, this is profound. I mean, uh, you're saying that the people who are already in difficult situation are the one who suffer the most and pandemic probably proved once again the same point. Uh, when we come back, I would like to discuss uh, with you um, a little more about the connection of civil rights movement and the establishment of those clinics, which you are saying are, is the largest healthcare network in our country. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and we are you are watching Muslim Network TV. We'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. This is Imam Malik Mujahid, and I'm talking with Thomas Tai. Um, so you were mentioning that uh, it was the result of the civil right movement mm -hmm. uh, that uh, a network of health clinics were mentioned. Uh, what was uh, that? Uh, do, you, do you have a little more on that? Because you're saying this is the largest network, healthcare network. Yeah. It so it's, they're called the federally qualified health centers and they were established or authorized under legislation enacted in 1965, um, uh, which as I said, uh, provided uh, federal funding to create community health centers in areas that were medically underserved. And that was a defined term in law um, or, or serving medic, now it's or medically underserved populations which, for example, may exist in a large city like Chicago. The, it's not a medically underserved area, but there are people within a, a you know an urban center that may themselves not have access. So, uh, you know, fast forward the tape now, 55 years later, and um, you can look at the National Association of Community Health Centers, and there are 12,000 nonprofit corporations that have been established to create these community health centers, one community health center corporation, a nonprofit corporation, may run up to 10 clinical sites as part of their operation. So there's 13,000 clinical sites, and that's that collectively take care of 30 million people in the United States. And they do such great work, but they're not very visible at all. I mean, because they're rooted in their communities, they're not spending in medically underserved areas that are tend to be areas of high poverty. And so they don't have a lot of money to advertise. They don't have marketing campaigns, but the quality of their work is provably good because they have standard data about patient outcomes and treatments. And, you know, if you're interested, the National Association of Community Health Centers has a wonderful website that details the history an outgrowth of the civil rights movement. Everyone knows the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. Fewer people know the Public Health Service Act Amendment of 1965, right? So it doesn't roll off the tongue. But I think it's just such an important part of our country. And we, it's a privilege for uh, Direct Relief to be part of mobilizing private philanthropic resources to support these institutions that are dedicated to providing health services to the least fortunate people in the United States, and they do a very good job of it. 
So these are <clears throat> these are funded by government, but organized by independent not-for-profits. Yeah. Or existing big hospital chains like in Chicago, University of Chicago or Northwestern, they open these things and benefit from the government funding. Uh, are the you know sometimes uh, billions and billions of dollars of network try to create something like that and uh, support help as well as get funding from the government as compared to the truly uh, community based community inspired and community run clinics so are there both mix of those most of them are not attached to a hospital system these are just um, they're their own animal you know they are federally qualified health centers, FQHCs. Chicago has some of the biggest ones in the country where, um, where there's a network, a nonprofit corporation that receives some federal funding, I think 50% uh, for your construction. And so you have to raise the rest of the money yourself. And then the conditions of funding are that uh, you must see everyone who shows up. You cannot, it doesn't matter if they're insured or uh, uninsured or undocumented or a, a citizen and um, and you have to provide services to everyone so it's strictly you know uh, non-discriminatory and it's very tough for these organizations to and they get Medicaid reimbursement that's how they finance their activities um, which differs from state to state so I think it's a, t a tough challenging uh, financing situation but because they do so much work that is, you know, for people they don't get a penny from or for, it's a really good place. And we provide prescription medications um, for those who can't afford them and need them through these clinics because they do, they're licensed both in their own state and have this federal status. And one of the interesting conditions uh, that's a requirement for these is that 51% of the board, uh, the boards of directors, must be current patients. So the idea was, how can we keep the the sensitivities rooted in these communities, and to make to make sure that they said the people who are the uh, responsible on the board of directors must be current patients. That's so that, amazing that, for democracy. I mean, this is just a uh, amazing principle that you know, unless you you know what it is, exactly. how will you be able to keep it community consent? Uh, wow, who wrote that law? I wonder. I, I better go to that website and figure that out. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the most effective pieces of legislation, I think, in the last uh, 70 years, the GI Bill and some of these other things. But it's, it's been successful, but it's not been highly um, you, you know, profiled. But it's it's a wonderful group of uh, Maybe its success has a lot to do that it is not high profile. Otherwise, somebody will go after it. Right. You're right. I think you're. They. It, to, it's like the Peace Corps. You mentioned I worked at the Peace Corps. We, although started by President Kennedy, you know, when I was uh, in the Clinton administration, I thought we just loved that there were six members of Congress who had themselves been in the Peace Corps, and three of them were Republicans, and three of them were Democrats. So we, you know, <laughs> something that everyone. It wasn't one party's or the others. It was just a national treasure. Um, and that's important, it, particularly now, is everything seems to be viewed through a pretty intense political lens, and not everything is political. Yes. A humanitarian group, and I think we don't ask, you know, for party affiliation or anything. And we just, yeah. if people are suffering, it's important. We learn this as children, help the people, um, do it without judgment, and, um, and then pick up all the other things that you were. Yeah, this Unfortunately, the politics seems to be uh, <clears throat> one variable which is in front of everything. And I'm just happy that uh, uh, that whole uh, community health system survives and thrives and uh, organizations like you are available to fill in the gap. So direct relief, although it's called direct relief, but it seems like just like FEMA, you are also involved in providing funding uh, and a uh, supportive role instead of directly being a service provider. Right, well, that's relatively recent. I think with uh, respect to the COVID pandemic, for example, 
we have stockpiles of PPE, we have stockpiles of medications, um, and we had an early signal, and we were concerned as the, the coronavirus arrived that the people who would be disproportionately affected were actually the people who have been disproportionately affected, right? People with low income, people who don't have access, rely on public transport, people served by these community health centers. So we, as we were providing PPE that we had uh, stockpiled, uh, there was recognition, we weren't doing fundraising, but a lot of people sent money in to direct relief to do more of that. And we thought, gosh, this money is really not for direct relief, it's for the people we're helping. And um, we were able to create a fund of, we gave away about $35 million in cash to community health centers just to shore them up because we knew that if they closed or their uh, health workers got sick, the only place their patients could go would be the hospital at a time when we were trying to keep people out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. So that became, just because we had the resources uh, available, we, we were able to provide the resource of cash in addition to the resource of medical material that we typically provide. So that was, you know, uh, not how we're not set up as a grant making organization typically, but in emergencies when we receive money, you know, we know it's not for direct relief, it's for the people that are affected by the emergency. So we try to give it away or just use as little as we can to do, cover our operating costs for transporting medications. But um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to provide financial resources to groups that are completely affected, doing all the work, but never on TV and that no one knows about. It's a big dilemma, right? So uh, we're happy to be, as a support organization, we think that's an important uh, role that we can play and, and love to do that whenever possible. That was extraordinary and very strategic. You know, you, you're supporting the system. If it collapses, there will be another mini disaster uh, into making and supporting in a direct way those who are connected with the most vulnerable. But where did you get all the PPEs? Everybody was fighting for those. Well, because, you know, California almost burns to the ground every year, we've been ma actually manufacturing our own um, N95 masks now in China for the past several years. So we have our own brand, you know, NIOSH approved, FDA approved. And it was just to filter out the, all the fine particulate matter that uh, is in, in wildfire smoke. Um, so that's why we knew a lot about masks and we had a few million of them in our warehouse. So that was a, and we knew how to buy them too, you know, because we had our own manufacturer and our own little brand. They cost about 70 cents for us to make. And so we, you know, when you start seeing people selling them for $10, it was just awful. So and one time it was way higher than that. <laughs> but just kind of obscene, you know? And so I think for us, you know, people who have a lot of money can typically get, get what they need. But people who don't are, you know, they, they need to rely on a public benefit, right? And so um, that was a focus. That's why we had stockpiled PPE to, in the event of another large series of wildfires, which we had, we have every year now in California, but then Australia earlier this year. Had oh, they, they had a huge problem there. So that's why we had some, you know, PPE of what we thought was a substantial stockpile it turned out to be, you know, <laughs> relatively modest against the need, but we've been able to replenish it. 3M um, in Minnesota, kind of the, the global company, you know, widely known for its the quality of its uh, products. For years, we have been their charitable channel for things like their protective masks and respirators. So they were able to provide donations, and that, that's typically how we work, encouraging material donations that we could then provide at no charge. Well, thank you so much, Thomas Satai. This is, um, you keep providing some very interesting information, which need to be on uh, New York Times and uh, top newspapers, but maybe it is better off not being there. Otherwise it will be whether it's Republican PPE or is it Democratic PPE. You're watching Muslim Network TV, uh, and we'll be right back after these messages.
Welcome back to Muslim Network TV. Uh, you're watching us on Galaxy 19 Satellite, uh, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, Apple TV, as well as our own website, muslimnetwork.tv. This is Imam Malik Mujahid. I'm talking with Thomas Tai, who is uh, a leader of uh, Direct Relief. Uh, it's an organization which seems to be very strategically placing uh, its effort uh, more focus on medical aspect of uh, uh, the disaster relief. Uh, you were mentioning FEMA's job description is to provide policies, strategic direction, and funding. And it does not go directly in helping people out. So what are the major institutions do they use when there is an urgent need to move not counting national guards and the army and the soldiers, who they directly on a shortest possible notice mobilize because when Katrina happened, uh, federal government came under a lot of pressure and uh, there were a lot of stories about FEMA being non-effective. I think Mr. Brown was his president who president uh, called uh, Brownie is doing a great job and pretty soon he was out. So, so so what I want to know is FEMA, if that is not their job to show up, who they expect to, to show up and support them? Well, I, I should say that FEMA should speak for itself, but I will <laughs> say, I will say that my impression is um, that they do have some pre-existing you know, arrangements or contracts for shelter services with the Red Cross, for example. I mean, so those are um, pre-existing relationships between FEMA and service providers that can be um, turned on in a particular area um, if necessary. You know, so they'll have the, they're the funding stream. It comes through FEMA and they can uh, make allocations to the county or the states when there's a presidential, uh, a federally declared disaster. So those funding streams through FEMA go to, you know, clean up work and uh, through contracts, uh, social services. And I think as you saw in Puerto Rico, uh, sometimes people can present a, a, a bid or they'll do a request for proposals and people can bid on things like large scale feeding programs. And then the, the FEMA uh, staff will determine and uh, who, you know, will be selected for those contracts. So. Uh, I think they're like most of, you know, when you get outside the, you know, the military, those are, they're operational every day. Law enforcement, police and sheriffs, they're operational every day. Um, hospitals and clinics, they're operational entities and firefighters. So those types of organizations tend to do very well, in my opinion, during emergencies because they're practicing every single day. If you're kind of a policymaker and a funder, you're not running a large scale operation every day with people and trucks and vehicles and logistics. That is an inherent tension, I think, that we have in the country. We have placed responsibility for managing large scale emergencies in the hands of people who are not operationally running op large scale operations. They're, they have a lot of money. Uh, but so do banks and, you know, the, the government. They, if they're not running it on a good day, it's very tough to run it on the worst day ever. So that's, I think, one of those chronic challenges that uh, FEMA and other organizations like it face. They have the expectation that they are in control during a chaotic time, but they're not in control in running the operations on a normal time. So, you know, there's an inherent, I think it, it needs to be rethought a bit because, you um, I, you know, you see the firefighters, they scale up, they scale down, they don't get overwhelmed, even when they're overwhelming circumstances, because I think they're operational every day. It's a, it's a huge differentiating factor between uh, operational organizations and policy and advisory or even advocacy organizations, I think. Mm. What is your advice? Uh, how individual? I mean, uh, did you ever hear about that? The September is the National Preparedness Month. Uh, yeah, I, I thought it was. I thought there was a uh, National Alfalfa Day. At some <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, California is an agricultural place, but 
you know, I, I did, I was aware of, uh, you know, September being prepared this month, but it doesn't, um, you know, I'm not sure how much people are just waiting for September to arrive because it's National Preparedness Month. <laughs> how, how, how do you advise organizations and individuals uh, to be prepared? Uh, I mean, the pandemic has told us none of us can ever handle something of this magnitude, uh, but there are some lessons to be learned, right? Yeah, certainly for um, places that have chronic risks of uh, natural disasters, I think the stockpiling of of food, having the list of uh, medications, the things that we see become crises. In the United States, you know, from a health perspective, it's not often mass trauma. Like a, it's not a, a Haiti earthquake scenario where you have hundreds of thousands of injured. You have a lot of mass evacuations that in themselves cause health problems because of the amount of chronic disease that exists broadly in our society. So those types of preparatory plans to make sure that you have your contact list, your medication list, that um, people know if you have to evacuate where you will go and how to get in touch with uh, each other. Um, the food, water, shelter are the basics in life, right? If you have food, water, shelter, um, you'll be okay for a short time. Medications is a necessary complement. So for all families, I think it's good for people to take a look at if they have a little uh, stockpile kit or a grab and go kit, it's a good time to look at it. And, you know, from an institutional uh, perspective, what we've seen, you know, we're my, the building I'm sitting in, it was the first permitted microgrid in the continental United States. And the only reason it is, so we have, a multiple uh, redundant power source, including a large solar array, because it's a big medical warehouse that I'm sitting in. We saw what happened in Puerto Rico when the power grid goes down. Everything goes down. You can't get money out of the bank. You can't get you know, health services um, if there's electronic health records. So power backup is a increasingly important, um, you know, it's a prerequisite for many things, information, money, communication. So I think having adequate power backup is something that we did not expect direct relief to be involved in. But in California, we've ended up providing now millions of dollars for community health centers that serve the least fortunate people to have backup power plans, solar arrays on their roofs or and, and big battery backups, because we have a, a big problem with uh, delivering power during fires. It gets cut off so those kinds of preparatory things are always good to um, when you have a moment outside of a crisis to spend some time and think about what could put you or your family or people you care about at risk. How much of your work is in the U.S. and how much is international? I think, you know, it, it was really Katrina where we started. Uh, we became licensed as a, a drug wholesaler in all 50 states because we thought this is terrible. I mean, you know, it's. It's the United States, why can't we help people? And, and, you know, because of the federal system and state regulations at the time, uh, you know, direct relief could provide prescription medications to Tanzania, but not to Texas. <laughs> so we didn't have a license in Texas. So I think uh, still about 85% or maybe 80% is international. 20% is in the United States, but the United States is our largest single country of activity. Um, it's about a quarter of a billion dollars of assistance each year in terms of the value of the medications we provide. And then this year was another, you know, $35 million in direct financial assistance. But the remaining amounts are dispersed over about 100 countries a year where direct relief has ongoing support activities for many of the health institutions that um, exist in throughout Latin America, Africa, and Asia that we try to support on an ongoing basis. And again, if there's an emergency, that's the network that we plug into and key off of as we're responding during a crisis. Hmm. I saw that 58% of your uh, 1.4 billion uh, uh, revenues came from individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, most large organization have some other model of funding, but not 58% coming from individuals. 
uh, how do you connect with the individual? What's your secret? I need a lot of money to run this television. Tell me about it. Well, you know, um, well, most of the one point four billion. The, most of that is contributed in kind material, right? So that's the value of the prescription medications that the manufacturers make available to us. So we'll we've been providing you know the charitable naloxone for drug overdoses for now four or five years from Pfizer. So they'll Pfizer makes it. You know, we must account for it and assign a value to it. So that may be you know, tens or uh, tens of millions of dollars that we have to reflect in our books. It's about a hundred million dollars that we received in the most recent um, fiscal year. That was the cash of which fifty-eight percent came from individuals. So the the overall revenue includes the value of contributed stuff. Um, the cash is different, but you know we've been very fortunate. We don't. Um, we've been a relatively low key fundraiser, but we just thought, you know, there's a lot of advice that people give about, you need to send a mail or you need to have this event. And most of my friends hate that, you know, they think, don't send me a calendar, you know, I have on the, and so what we thought we could do is really what you're doing, just do our work well and try to have a way to communicate it and have people able to find you through social media channels or in the media. We hired a couple of journalists who, whose job is to just write about the people and the issues and the places that Direct Relief works. And you can follow us on Apple News or Google News or Bing News. We're an authorized news source now for, um, for many people. And it's not fundraising because it can't be, but it's actually visibility about the substantive issues that we're working on. And that has brought a more awareness about what Direct Relief is, is doing. And, uh, and that seems to have been a, have a pot of, had a pos- positive effect on, on the financial support. But, you know, I, I was writing down, I, you know, Muslim TV, network TV is a really good idea. We don't have our own TV network, Imam. Um, <laughs> well, we can help you get started. That will be our support for the good work which you do, strategically supporting community centers, which you mentioned is the largest network up there. Uh, tell me this, uh, when your house uh, last year itself became, uh, you know, it was completely destroyed or something like that? So, so when you rebuilt, what do you kept in mind? Well, we, yeah, the, the mudslide, you know, Santa Barbara's got a little strip of land between the ocean and mountains. And so we had a bad fire and then a big rain and the mountain came rolling down the hill and, and tragically killed over 20 people. And it just left this swath of destruction, including my house. So we were fortunate we were my family was fine um health wise but you know you lose your house you have to rebuild it and you're now sensitive to the risks that exist uh what the the local government did was they imposed new building requirements so that you actually have to increase the elevation of your house so that could not happen again and and strengthen all of the um and protect against any future such um risks so it's, you know, that has been required to make sure it's safer, sturdier, at higher elevation to protect against the risks, um, which makes it a longer rebuilding process. But that often happens in all these places affected by, by storms. Uh, the building codes are upgraded basically to, uh, in recognition of whatever happened during those storms. And that is a challenge for, a, you know, the, the homeowner, but it's important as a matter of public policy i think to do it so we're you know getting near three years out but you know we're looking there's now a structure um that's framed for the tide family and uh we can't wait to get back to our little house um, right. you have been with peace corps as a chief operating officer uh, peace corps is also one of these things which uh America doesn't quite know as much as about. Uh, tell me a couple of your uh, stories of working with people like that. Yeah, well, you know, I was in the Peace Corps as a Peace Corps volunteer after I, I finished law school, which is a bad career move for anyone considering don't go to law school and then go into the Peace Corps and make no money. 
Your will be disappointed in um, your choice, but well, but uh, your choice was great. It put you in a lifelong track of service. Right, and that really is an opportunity. I think that again, the recognition that uh, existed in 1961 when the Peace Corps was founded, that was the height of the Cold War, and I think the idea of the Kennedy family and Sergeant Shriver, um, you know, from Chicago, and uh, the first director of the Peace Corps, he recognized that if people from different countries only meet through their militaries or their diplomats, that's bad. You know, there's these, you know, national strategic interests sometimes that cause tensions between uh, sovereign countries, but people generally don't hate each other. <laughs> you know, they, they generally like each other. And so you have to provide an opportunity for people who from different backgrounds uh, to have a chance to work alongside each other. And uh, the United States was relatively isolated. So the idea was let's send people out there just to help with no agenda, just to, to work in a role that the local government, the host government identified and give people a chance to work uh, alongside each other and learn about each other culturally. So I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Thailand, um, which was fascinating for me having grown up in California. Um, and I learned a lot about just a completely different culture, most of it um, Buddhist, kind of, but where I lived, it was predominantly Muslim in southern Thailand. So you went in the southern Thailand, Patai area, Patani, I think they call it. Yeah, yeah. I was in Langu, uh, a very small district, but, you know, so, you know, there was not a mosque where I grew up in, you know, Palo Alto. Um, and there was one ringing uh, about a block away every morning. So it was a you know, just eye-opening, uh, enriching, and it's hard to be judgmental. It's easy to be judgmental uh, and stereotype people if you don't know anyone with that background. So I think the idea of having people learn about each other, work together as a check against the potential for, you know, just whatever the strategic interest or government posturing might be. And I think largely it's worked. I think a lot of people from the Peace Corps went into the diplomatic service. If they went into business, I think that was um, enriching. And people like the, the, the founder of Netflix was a Peace Corps volunteer in Africa. And I'm sure that that influenced his uh, outlook on life. It just, it, it's enriching. And it, uh, for me personally, it, it, it was so interesting. Um, it led me to a series of uh, additional activities, and you really see the disparities that exist in the world. You know, everyone. What were you doing there? Were you teaching, or what were you doing there? Yeah, I was an English teacher. I think originally I was going to go to Africa, uh, to Liberia, to be a teacher, and there was a coup at the time, so they said, "Can you go to Thailand?" And I said, "Okay, yeah." yeah. So I was an English teacher for second seventh grade through high school students basically um it was one of the core uh english as a the foreign language in thailand was one of the requirements to get into the university and a big part of uh really employment because of the tourist industry so this was in the last millennium imam uh in the in the 80s so yes i know several time um but but, they smart people who thought you're an american agent anyway yeah yeah, no, it was, um, I'm looking for, I, you know, and unfortunately with the coronavirus, it's the first time since 1961 that every Peace Corps volunteer has been brought home. Mm. It's never happened before. So that's, you know, I hope that it can be reestablished and continue rolling because the opportunity, it's different if you're working with someone than if you're trying to sell them something. So I think if the interactions are only through business transactions, I think that's an incomplete understanding of, of a culture and that respect and appreciation and understanding of different so backgrounds. You were working there, uh, Thomas. So were some people suspicious of you that why this man has come to this area? You know, the, the Peace Corps um, had been around Thailand for a long time. So I think they thought, um, why is this weird person living in our, in our town? <laughs> because he looks different and he speaks Thai, strangely, but I think um, there. by the time I was there in 1986, I don't think there was suspicion, although where I was in Thailand, that was a, a one, the one place where there was some tension 
really along um, ethnic kind of the Malay Thai border was an area of, under some dispute at the time. So, but I think for me personally, you know, there was always the joke that the suspicion was that um, the Peace Corps was a, a front for spies. And once you met a Peace Corps volunteer, they realized they would never, <laughs> this person. <laughs> So they were very successfully spy. They were able to fool the whole world. <laughs> you know, so um, Peace Corps uh, work is increasing. I mean, uh, minus the pandemic, is is this a growing thing, or is it just uh, one of those things sitting there? Well, you know, we'll see if it gets reestablished. I think it's, um, you know, one of the uh, that was unusual at the time. I think the Peace Corps is a government sponsored. It's kind of a government-sponsored NGO almost, um, which I had to remind people when I was on the staff that, oh, no, we are part of the government. We can't do whatever we want, you know. But I think so. Now there are many more opportunities where NGOs have been established. There's a lot of service opportunities for for young or or even retired people to to work internationally with, with uh, you know, civil society organizations to perform kind of community service or to do development work, not exclusively through the Peace Corps. So there are other alternatives now. And I just hope the Peace Corps, because it's been a really, you know, wonderful jewel of the United States, I hope that it can continue to, to thrive after the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic subsides a bit. Thank you so much, Thomas Thai. Thomas Thai is president of Direct Relief and doing an amazing work. Um, and thank you, Dr. Abdul Wahid, for producing today's show. Well, Sher uh, for producing today's show, and Dr. Abdul Wahid for being being the backup. You're watching Galaxy 19 Satellite, Amazon Fire TV, Raku, and Muslim Network TV uh, on MuslimNetwork.tv website as well. Peace and salam. Be safe. Be prepared for the disaster. Thank you.